everybody, I'm Natasha Kirchuk, and thanks for joining us for ILTV's weekly program, One on One with Alan Dershowitz. We want to give you, our viewers, a chance to have your questions answered by Professor Dershowitz, one of America's greatest legal minds. He is a leading expert on criminal and constitutional law, civil liberties, and the Arab-Israeli conflict. Hi, Professor Dershowitz. It's so great to have you. Likewise. So it's just a week before the elections. We're going to have a lot of questions, some related to that. Let's get started. Professor, as you know, every week we open our show with a special guest. Today we're honored to have the Deputy Speaker of the Knesset, Yechiel Hilik Bal, who is also the Secretary General of the Labor Party and an active Knesset member. On November 4th, Israel will be marking the, the 21st anniversary of the tragic murder of former Israeli Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin, a man who fought with all of his power for peace in the Middle East, as we all know. Let's hear what M.K. Bell wants to ask about this devastating event in Israeli history. Dear uh, Professor Darshowitz, uh, my name is uh, Chilik Bar, a member of Knesset, Deputy Speaker of the Knesset and Secretary General of the Israeli Labor Party. I've been serving my party and the Knesset and explaining Israel's significance to an uh, audience of all faith all over the world for many years. Uh, this week we will be marking uh, the tragic day in 1995 that Yitzhak Rabin, one of Israel's greatest leaders and heroes and prime minister, uh, um, was murdered because he tried to uh, bring peace and tolerance inside the Israeli society. I've personally been involved with organizing uh, a memorial gathering uh, in his honor uh, in Rabin Square this coming Saturday. What should we do, uh, to your knowledge, uh, not only to honor his memory, uh, but to advance the legacy that Yitzhak Rabin left for all of us. More importantly, what can we do uh, 21 years later, after he was murdered and assassinated, to ensure uh, that we learned the needed lesson uh, from this dark moment uh, in our uh, history, so that we can and may provide people uh, everywhere with hope I will be more than happy to hear your answer, and I send you uh, very warm regards from Jerusalem. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and thank you for the great work you do on uh, Israel's behalf. Uh, I'll never forget <clears throat> the day that uh, Prime Minister Rabin was murdered. <clears throat> it was one of the few assassinations in world history that really had an impact uh, on, on the world and on politics. Um, my own belief is that if Yitzhak Rabin had lived, um, there would now be at least some kind of a peace between the Israelis and the Palestinians. He was determined to make the kinds of sacrifices that are required to bring about peace. And I think <clears throat> his memory, his legacy, ought to be a constant reminder that the current status quo is not acceptable as a long-term resolution. Um, there's been no better time than today for the Israelis to make the most generous offers of peace, offers of the kind made by uh, former Prime Minister uh, Ehud Barak and former Prime Minister Ehud Olmert. Uh, I think that the time has come <clears throat> to repeat uh, offers of that general nature well before the United Nations uh, gets its hands into this process, which will be a disaster if President Obama fails to veto the French resolution. There will never be peace because the Palestinians will have no incentive to make the kinds of sacrifices that are required to make peace, giving up the right of return, uh, agreeing that Israel's capital is Jerusalem, that Israel is the nation state of the Jewish people. It will have the false belief that they could get statehood through the United Nations. So this is the time for the Israelis to renew the offers they made uh, back uh, 15 years ago and uh, eight years ago. Uh, this is the time for the Palestinians finally to accept Benjamin Netanyahu's offer to sit down and negotiate with no uh, preconditions, a negotiated resolution between the Israelis and the Palestinians without any involvement of the United Nations. Let me repeat, without any involvement of the United Nations uh, is what would do the memory of this great man, Yitzhak Rabin, uh, justice. Uh, anything short of a negotiated peace will not do justice to the great memory of Yitzhak Rabin. 
Now, Alan, I'd like to ask you about something that's never been brought to light and has been kept secret for 25 years. Our producer, Danny Grossman, told me that he escorted Israel's ambassador to Washington to your office just a week before Yitzhak Rabin's assassination took place in 1995. The stated purpose of the meeting was to advance Rabin's scheduled visit to Boston a few weeks later to give a speech at Harvard and to attend the General Assembly of the Jewish organizations that was held in Boston that year. But from what I understand, the real purpose of that meeting was actually that Rabin had a secret mission he wanted you to undertake. It seems as though Rabin was very much aware of the rising tensions and violence in Israel, and he wanted you to act as a mediator to help him lower the flames on uh, uh, you know, these tensions. Now. The left respected you as a civil libertarian, and the right respected you as a great defender of Israel, so that would have been a very uh, important mission for you. Can you tell us more about this story? Well, I'll never forget the uh, Friday before the Saturday night, that is <clears throat> nine days before he was killed, when uh, Itamar Rabinovitz and Danny Grossman came to my office, uh, and they told me about the desire of the Prime Minister, Prime Minister Rabin, to meet with me. Uh, I put it in my calendar for the following Tuesday. Uh, he was supposed to be in Boston for the GA, the General Assembly, as well as for a speech at Harvard. And <clears throat> we were going to talk about what role I could possibly play in lowering the rhetoric, lowering the temperature. He did not want to in any way diminish free speech. Uh, he believed that people had the right to protest him, to protest his peace plans, but he was concerned that the rhetoric uh, was calling for violence. And there were, as you know, some rabbis who were describing him dis despicably, describing him as a rodaif, uh, misusing the biblical and Rambam uh, concept, distorting the Jewish religion to use Judaism as a justification for, for murder. And he wanted to talk to me about what role I could play in striking an appropriate balance between maintaining uh, Israel's deep commitment to free speech and political discourse, while at the same time trying to reduce the rhetoric and the temperature of the rhetoric and trying to reduce or eliminate uh, incitements uh, to murder. Um, I, I wish I had had an opportunity to play that role. I wish I had had an opportunity to try to keep uh, Prime Minister Rabin alive, but it was not to be, and we have to move forward. And I think we have to move forward by recognizing that at this time, when the Sunni-Shia divide has never been greater, when uh, there are efforts on the part of powerful emirate countries to try to create alliances with Israel, that a peace process with the Palestinians will strengthen Israel's hand enormously in the international community and in the Middle East at a time when Israel's hand needs to be strengthened. Absolutely. No. Thanks, Professor. Let's hear some questions from our viewers. Al Kittleson is an airline captain and a former U.S. Force, Air Force pilot, and he wants to know what we can expect to happen on Election Day in the United States after the most recent controversial events. Hi, Alan. My name is Alan also. I'm an airline pilot from Texas. I saw you on Fox last night. I'd just like to get to your opinion of what's been going on with FBI Director Comey and what do you think may happen in terms of his statements influencing the election next week. It's a rather interesting situation. I enjoyed your comments as to how he probably should have clarified the situation and uh, would like to know what you think about potential influence in the election. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Great question. You know, here the United States can learn a great deal from Israel. In the United States, the the um, Attorney General of the United States is both a political appointee of the President, part of the Cabinet of the President, and also the Chief Law Enforcement Officer. That creates an inherent conflict of interest. Um, that may explain why former President Bill Clinton had a meeting with her on an airplane, a meeting that never should have taken place. Uh, in Israel, there is an attempt to separate law enforcement from politics. You have a Minister of Justice which is a political uh, position, a cabinet political position. And then you have the attorney general, which is a quasi-judicial, independent uh, position. Uh, and then you have the director of public prosecution, also independent. I think we could borrow that and, and, and do very well in the United States if, if we did. Uh, the tragedy is that we have a weak attorney general. 
who has taken herself out of the case and has really left it to the director of the FBI. And it's not the proper role of the director of the FBI to be making announcements about the status of ongoing investigations. <clears throat> we learned from the New York Times report just now that uh, a different standard was applied to uh, investigations regarding Trump's former uh, campaign uh, director. Uh, and the FBI cannot be perceived as having a double standard. So I think the Comey statement may very well have an impact on the election, may well turn it from Hillary Clinton to Donald Trump. Certainly the polls have narrowed uh, following Comey's ill-advised statement. And I think he has an obligation to clarify that when he made that statement, he knew no more than any of us knew about the content of the emails. The Fourth Amendment to the United States Constitution would prohibit the FBI from looking at Huma Abedin's emails based on seizing the computer of a, her husband who was being investigated for a very different crime. So the FBI did not know what was in those emails unless they cheated and peeked, and presumably they did not. And so Comey has an obligation now to say that although he made that statement to Congress, he knows nothing about the content of the emails and nobody should presume anything negative in regard to Hillary Clinton from those emails. But I don't think he's going to say that. And I think he may go down in history as an FBI agent who had a negative impact on an American election. And that would be a great, great tragedy. Professor, even if we take at face value that FBI Director Comey is, as you claim, a man of great integrity, don't his actions send a, set a very dangerous precedent for the future? Perhaps others who are not so purely motivated might abuse the justice system to favor one candidate over another. Do you find it ironic that Donald Trump has been claiming all along that the election is rigged? Could you say that this latest development might be a way of rigging the election against Hillary? I don't think that uh, Director Comey intended to impact the elections. I think he intended to preserve his own reputation. Comey is a man of distinction and of honesty. But remember that the building he works in is named after J. Edgar Hoover, who was a thug and uh, a man who would cheat and break the law in order to enhance his own power, a man who would try very much to influence the outcome of a presidential election if it could benefit him. And so you always have to look at the worst case scenario. Constitutions are not written for angels. Laws are not created for good people. They're created for bad people. They're created to prevent abuse. And I think the precedent established by Comey in this election could be used in future elections by people who have less integrity than he does. And that's why I'm so worried about it. Thanks for your response, Professor. Let's turn to a question all the way from Los Angeles, California. Gabriela Neyman is less concerned about the U.S. elections and more concerned about the political future within the Palestinian territories, given the effect it could have on the chances for peace with Israel. Let's hear what she has to ask. Hi, Professor. My name is Gabriela, and I've lived in Finland, Israel, New Zealand, and currently in Los Angeles. While the entire world is focused on the U.S. elections, I want to talk to you about the democratic free elections and the cultural differences that sometimes make elections counterproductive in societies which are not ready for them. Many people rejoiced when the Arab Spring promised a new world order, which didn't end up the way they expected. And this leads me to asking you, what do you think will end up happening in the PA after Mahmoud Abbas. Do you think that the lack of a stable, democratic Palestinian culture can be a real threat to peace? And do you think that the people in the West will wake up to this as opposed to only focusing on the numbers of homes Israelis have built over the Green Line? Thank you. Gabriella, that's a great question. Uh, Anatoly Sharansky, who is a, a great uh, intellectual, uh, wrote repeatedly about the nature of democracy. Democracy is not a one-day election. Democracy is a process. And a one-day election followed by tyranny, such as what happened when Hamas won essentially the last legislative election, and then by force and violence took over in Gaza and uh, has used repressive anti-democratic devices uh, right from the beginning. Uh, look, Adolf Hitler could have won a, a, a genuine, legitimate election in 1936, 1937. He was extremely popular. 
among the Germans. Nobody would dream of calling 1936 Germany a democracy with its uh, detention centers, its torture, uh, its uh, Nuremberg laws, etc. So democracy is more than a vote. And um, sometimes uh, when you have just a vote without democracy, uh, you put in power some of the most undemocratic uh, forces. So I think the Palestinian Authority has to work on creating a culture of democracy, a culture that will encourage a real and democratic elections. Uh, one can only hope that would happen. Um, when I go to Ramallah and a visit with the leaders of the Palestinian Authority, I become encouraged. But then when I see what happens uh, when I and others leave and the incitement that comes from official organs of the Palestinian Authority, uh, the incitement to violence, the uh, undemocratic way in which dissidents are sometimes treated uh, in the Palestinian Authority, uh, I become discouraged. So I do think that the world has to demand of the Palestinian Authority what they've always demanded of Israel, transparency, openness, real democracy, and uh, voting is a part of that real democracy. But uh, voting without uh, democratic accountability and democratic continuity can sometimes be a very, very dangerous phenomenon. Thanks, Professor. Now, to close our viewers' questions, we have a great surprise for you. Dr. Arthur Edelman is a renowned professor of pediatric health care from New York's Albert Einstein School of Medicine, as well as Hebrew University. Let's turn to his question. Hi, Shalom Avi. This is the voice from the past. I therefore have a right to ask you almost any question. We grew up together, went to elementary school, high school, even spent time at Yale. I have medicine, as you remember, and you went you know, off to law. Among other things, you ended up being a criminal defense lawyer, associating with not a small number of us very unsavory characters. If you had to do it again, would you really want to become a criminal defense lawyer? Maybe an NBA player or a stand-up comic? What do you think? Hey, uh, Artie. Artie uh, Edelman was a very important part of my growing up. Um, he came from a very cultured family, and his parents used to listen to opera and symphony. Uh, his late uh, sister was a, a great uh, cultural uh, person, cultured person, and author, of course, spoke fluent Hebrew, went to Camp Massad, uh, where we were in the same bunk in 1948. Noam Chomsky was the uh, division leader and counselor. So Artie, you bring back great, great memories. Artie was also a great athlete. Uh, we both sat on the bench together in Madison Square Garden when uh, Brooklyn Town Medical Academy played Manhattan Town Medical Academy. On the opposing bench was a kid named Ralphie Lipschitz, who became Ralph Loren. So uh, this is great uh, nostalgia. I look forward to seeing an uh, author who has become a great and phenomenal a doctor in Israel, saving many, many lives uh, in the process. Every time I go to Israel, I like to meet with Arthur and Arlene, great, great friends from the past, hopefully great, great friends for the future as well. Hey, Arthur, I want to throw a question back at you. You're a doctor, and you've had many patients uh, in your life who uh, haven't turned out to be such good people. You've probably saved some lives of kids who've done some terrible things. Uh, my daughter-in-law is an emergency room doctor. She treats people who come in off the street. She doesn't ask questions. Uh, what are you going to do when I save your life? You're going to go out and do good things or bad things. Uh, being a criminal lawyer means associating both with great, great people. I associated with Natan Sharansky, who was falsely charged uh, with crimes. I associated with Meyer uh, Kahana. I've represented good people and bad people, just like you, author, have treated good people and bad people. A rabbi, a priest, a minister, ministers to good and bad alike. It's a very important part of democracy, that everybody accused of crime be afforded a counsel. And since I've been a professor for 50 years and I've been teaching that, I couldn't apply a double standard to myself. So yes, I have represented, and let me admit it right now, I have won cases on behalf of people who have done bad things. I have never had a case where I've gotten a client acquitted and he's done it, gone out and done it again. So I'm very proud of that, but that could happen at any time in my life. So being a criminal defense lawyer, uh, requires that you make personal sacrifices of morality, just like being a priest and taking confession from a murderer, uh, or being a doctor and treating in the emergency ward uh, a person who you know may go out and do some terrible things. We each have roles to perform in a democracy. My role is to be a criminal defense lawyer. I would do it again. 
I've had a great uh, and productive life being a criminal defense lawyer. I'm more than a criminal defense lawyer. I also am involved deeply in politics, in the defense of Israel, in writing books. I've had a very balanced and full life. And I hope, Arthur, you and I can continue to have full and balanced lives uh, and make Borough Park a proud of us and Brooklyn Talmudical Academy and Yeshiva Eitz Chaim. And may we both go from strength to strength. So thank you, Arthur. And it's great to see you looking well. And it's great to hear your voice. Great, great answer, Professor. All right, before we sign off, I have a final question for you. Since our show is pre-recorded, this is our last broadcast before the election, so I'd like to put you on the spot and ask you to make a prediction. Who do you think will win? And while you're at it, please make another prediction about the seventh game of the World Series, which starts in a few minutes, but will be history by the time the show is on air. Yeah. Look, I'm, I'm rooting for both teams in the World Series. Neither has had a world championship. There used to be the three teams were together, you know, Boston, Cleveland, and, and Chicago. But now Boston broke that and has had three world championships. So, of course, I'm rooting for Terry Francona, who I love, who's the manager of, um, of Cleveland. Uh, uh, and, of course, Epstein is the general manager of Chicago. There are many former Red Sox on both teams. Uh, what I was hoping for was a seven-game series. Uh, we have a seven-game series. I have to make a speech tonight, unfortunately, but I'll be able to watch at least the last three or four innings of the game. I guess emotionally I have to be rooting for the Cubs. They haven't won a championship in more than uh, 100 years. As far as the presidential election is concerned, I wrote in my book, Electile Dysfunction, that you cannot predict the outcome of this election because it's emotional. And emotional elections like Brexit or the FARC election in South America are very hard to predict. A candidate like Donald Trump underperforms in the polls. And so if he's two or less points behind in the general, uh, in the polls, in the run-up to the election, he may very well uh, win. Hillary Clinton has the advantage in the electoral college. So if I had to bet widows and orphans money on the outcome, I would probably still put my money on uh, Hillary Clinton. I think Hillary Clinton will be a much better president than she has been a candidate. And I think Donald Trump has been a better candidate than he will be a president. But uh, whoever wins the election, uh, people have to support their president and try to influence them in ways that are positive for the United States, for world peace, for Israel. Very important that all American elections, uh, that Israel remains a bipartisan issue, that whoever wins uh, will be listening to people who support Israel and trying to do what's best for Israel. So my prediction is Hillary Clinton but as I wrote in my book, Electile Dysfunction, very difficult to predict the outcome of this kind of election because of what Hillary Clinton has done in the past, which has come out to haunt her, what Donald Trump will do in the future. Uh, voter turnout is very difficult to predict, and emotional elections are difficult to predict. So stay tuned and watch election night. Yeah, I guess we're going to have to wait it out, and we'll hear your comments, obviously, when we film our show the day after the elections. All right, that's all the time we have for today. Unfortunately, thanks so much for your time, Professor Dershowitz. I also want to thank all of our guests, especially Knesset member Yechiel Chilik Bar. If you'd like Professor Dershowitz to answer your questions, go to ILTV.TV or our Facebook page and submit them. We'll see you again next week. Take care, Alan. Thank you.